Stream elements. Said. Skullcross is now live. Streaming Assassin's Creed Origins. Pop on in. Welcome to Discovery Tour by Assassin's Creed Ancient Egypt.
They got the controls around the wrong fucking way. Welcome to Alexandria, planning of the city. Game developers, Alexander's plan to build game his great city get the, began to look with a verse from Homer's the Odyssey. One. There is, in front of Egypt, in the sea with many swells, an island called Pharos. Guided by these clues, Alexander the Great founded his future city at the western end of the Nile Delta. Though Alexander considered this location ideal for his great city, it presented considerable challenges. Too difficult to access during storms, the surrounding swamps threatened disease, and the limestone soil prevented the growth of healthy crops. However, due to the influence of his mentor Aristotle, Alexander the Great recognized that the true value was its strategic emplacement. Alexander knew that in controlling Pelusium to the east, Memphis to the south, and his crowning glory Alexandria to the west, he would create a triangular stronghold, allowing him to control the entire delta while giving him access to the Mediterranean. The great walls of Alexandria had a humble beginning. Lacking chalk to outline the future city's foundations, architects were forced to use flour instead. Clouds of migrating birds swept down and ate the flour, erasing the plans. This prompted Alexander to seek guidance from the oracles, who reassured him that his future city was destined to feed a large population. Excavations led by Mahmoud Bey El Falaki in the 19th century revealed that the wall enclosure measured approximately 5.2 kilometers in length and 2.2 kilometers in width. It was roughly 9 meters in height. These formidable ancient walls would resist a number of attacks, including fending off the king of Syria in 169 BCE. It wasn't until 295 CE that they eventually fell to Roman Emperor Diocletian, and this only after eight months of relentless assault. Alexandria's principal architect, Dinocrates, chose a Hippodamian grid plan. 
The grid maximized functionality with wide straight roads and canals running beneath them. Alexander recognized the military value of the city's design. The wide parallel streets gave him optimal surveillance of the city while allowing the unobstructed flow of troops. A central corridor ran from the Mediterranean's north port down to Lake Mariotis to the south. This thoroughfare acted as an unobstructed link for commercial trade and travel between the two ports. Many of the streets were bordered with grand buildings and parks, including Canopic Street, with its impressive gate bordering the eastern end. Alexandria was most likely built upon an already existing Egyptian village. Upon its completion, the Egyptians reviled the city, refusing to call it by its founder's name. Instead, they called it Raked, the building, as a mark of disdain, which was later Hellenized into Rakotis. Despite this, the name Alexandria would remain. Welcome to Introduction to Alexandria. After conquering Egypt in 331 BCE, Alexander the Great decided to build a new city, which, as per his habit, he named after himself. After his death, Alexandria quickly became the capital city of the Ptolemaic Kingdom and the most important city of the Greek world. The city was built between the Mediterranean Sea and Lake Mariotis, which resulted in Alexandria becoming a crucial cultural hub and trading center. Sumptuous buildings could be seen wherever one turned their gaze. The royal palaces, the many temples, the gymnasium, lush public gardens, and large avenues. With its incomparable beauty and advantageous geographic location, 
Alexandria attracted foreigners, intellectuals, and traders. One of the most cosmopolitan cities of the ancient world, Alexandria supplanted even Athens as the most important Greek city in history. Egyptian obelisks were highly prized by Roman architects. While Roman design previously favored the use of a single monument, Egyptian obelisks tended to come in pairs and were generally located at the entrance of temples. Several ancient Egyptian obelisks are still in existence today, though many are spread out across the world in locations such as Paris, Rome, New York, and London. All of this shows that Alexandria was significantly influenced by the rich past of Egypt. Alexandria had several main streets. Its most famous artery was the Canopic Way. It was lined with sumptuous buildings, houses, and temples, and was roughly eight kilometers in length. This street was one of the most important shipping entrances to Alexandria, and often hosted processions and festivals. street, 30 meters, was abnormally large even by Greek standards. This is likely because the Canopic Way was made in a short span of time and based on an urban plan, as opposed to being slowly built over time, as was usual for the era. The Canopic Way originated in the western cemeteries, skirted the gymnasium, and then exited the city to head east through massive doorways towards Canopus. This structure was known as the Canopic Door. Welcome to the Siege of Alexandria. Among the collection of writings attributed to Julius Caesar are his descriptions of the Siege of Alexandria, the Gallic Wars, and the commentaries on the Civil War. These archives contain information on different campaigns, the wars of Alexandria, Africa, and Spain. Each of them recounts Caesar's military activity from 58 BCE to 45 BCE. 
Though Caesar's documents remain a main source of information, it's important to note that the perspective is limited. It is necessary for other historical documents to be taken into consideration to provide a better understanding of events. The siege of Alexandria closely relays the events of the Civil War that led up to the event and describes how Caesar was besieged in the palace of the Ptolemies. Other ancient authors have left equally valuable and sometimes contradictory information. In the events leading up to the siege of Alexandria, Cleopatra VII and her brother were fighting over control of Egypt. Young King Ptolemy XIII's regent, Pothinus, had firm control over the young pharaoh, and an outmaneuvered Cleopatra soon went into hiding. This set the stage for Pompey's arrival in Alexandria. Having lost his battle against Caesar in 48 BCE, the Roman general turned to his allies, the Egyptians, for safe harbor. But on the advice of Pothinus, Ptolemy XIII had Pompey assassinated in the hopes of earning Caesar's favor. This would turn out to be a most unfortunate decision. Upon his arrival in Alexandria, Caesar was presented with Pompey's head. The sight of a Roman murdered by Egyptians did not sit well with him. Caesar made his displeasure clear, ordering the return of Cleopatra and for the siblings to resolve their differences and resume their co-rule of Egypt as per the will of their father. Neither Pothinus nor Ptolemy XIII wished to accede to this demand. While doing his best to aggravate Caesar, Pothinus secretly plotted against the Roman ruler and sent word for Egyptian general Achilles to bring his 20,000 men to fight on his behalf. While Pothinus plotted against Caesar, Cleopatra made a bold move. There are various descriptions of the encounter between Caesar and Cleopatra. One report states that she snuck into the palace alone at night. Another account claims she was accompanied by an ally and was brought inside the palace wrapped in a carpet bag. Though exactly what happened at this fateful meeting is up for debate, what is known is that Cleopatra met with Caesar and earned his approval. Pothinus and Ptolemy XIII were most vexed with this turn of events.
With Cleopatra finally present, Caesar chose to act as mediator between the siblings in the hopes of a peaceful resolution. It did not take long for things to sour. During a banquet given to celebrate the reconciliation, there was an assassination attempt on Caesar. It was the Roman leader's own barber who thwarted the attack. Once it was revealed that the king's regent, Pothinus, had ordered the attack, Caesar had him executed. He then placed the young king under guard. They've got the control the wrong way around in games. I don't know why they do that. It's, it's wrong. Caught within the palace with roughly 4,000 troops and with the knowledge that the arrival of enemy forces was imminent, Caesar sent for help from Syria, Rhodes, and Cilicia. He ordered his men to dig a ditch around the palace and build a wall leading to the harbor. This would ensure Caesar's access to the sea. When Egyptian General Achilles arrived in the city with 20,000 men, the battle for Alexandria began. With so few men at his disposal, Caesar could not risk a battle just yet. He sent ambassadors to Achilles in the name of Ptolemy to propose a truce. Knowing that the orders did not come from the young king and angered by the pharaoh's imprisonment, Achilles had the messengers assassinated. With Caesar confined within the palace, Achilles positioned his troops around the city. Skirmishes broke out throughout the streets of Alexandria and went on for several days and nights. Though they were outnumbered, Caesar's men were able to hold the enemy back. This prompted Achilles' next move, capture the Roman fleet stationed in the harbor.
Although the palace offered protection, losing the port meant the end of help and supplies. Caesar knew he had to protect the fleet. While he and his troops succeeded in regaining control of the port, he knew it would be impossible to sustain. Caesar ordered the burning of the ships. With passage back to the palace closed off, he headed for the lighthouse of Alexandria. Fighting their way through the Egyptian troops, Caesar and his men eventually reached Ferris Island. There, they took refuge within the lighthouse. With easy access to the open sea, Caesar was able to send messages to his allies requesting reinforcements and more supplies. The island fort also allowed him to control access to the harbor by relying on the chains used by the Egyptians to control ship traffic to and from Alexandria's docks. The exact chronology of events during the war in Alexandria remain imprecise. Conflicting accounts raise questions as to when, and even if, the Great Library of Alexandria was burned down at all. One account states that during the fighting, docks and warehouses were burned, and this was the fire that spread to the library. In another account, when Achilles cut off the harbor, Caesar had to leave the safety of the palace to defend his ships. As the enemies battled across the port, their arsenals set ships ablaze, and this destruction spread to the library. In either case, the Great Library was not completely destroyed. Experts point out that its location was too far from the harbor, and much later texts refer to the Great Library as being intact. Warehouses near the harbor contained manuscript copies awaiting export, and it is more likely that these documents were destroyed than the Great Library itself. The destruction of the Great Library may have been due to a number of fires over the ages. Its end was probably closer to the 4th century CE, when the Christian Emperor Theodosius I ordered the closure of all pagan temples. While some documents survived after being moved away, it remains unclear just what knowledge may have been lost. Where there are accounts of Achilles being in control of the battle against Caesar, it appears that instead Cleopatra's sister, siding with her brother, had him killed and put her ally Ganymedes in his place. Ganymedes proved a valuable tactician for the Egyptian side. It was his idea to cut Caesar's access to the harbor, thus trapping Caesar at the palace. During the time of Ptolemy I, canals had been dug throughout Alexandria to provide fresh water. Ganymedes had his men take control of these canals. After isolating their own water supply, he had his men pour salt water into the canals and cisterns that led to Caesar's camp. Panic erupted in Caesar's men. They wouldn't last long without fresh water. Recognizing that the porous limestone could help them, Caesar and his men dug wells to restore their water supply. 
Days later, the 37th Legion, comprised of Pompey's soldiers, arrived by ship. Unable to come ashore due to the winds, Caesar risked going out to meet them on the peninsula, Cape Cursonese. When the enemy learned Caesar's location, they rushed to intercept. Despite an obvious advantage for the Alexandrians, Caesar, with a Rhodian ship full of skillful sailors, emerged victorious. With help from the Allied ships, Caesar's victory enabled him to push the Egyptians back and secure the lighthouse. Gaining control of Ferris Island sent the Alexandrians into the sea and swimming back to the city. However, Caesar's fortification of the island didn't last long. The enemy regrouped and were set to storm the island. Panic-stricken, in spite of Caesar's encouragement, many of his men then fled their posts, either by ship or jumping into the sea. Caesar attempted to retreat, but Port Eunostos' harbor was overrun with enemy ships, preventing escape. Reportedly, Caesar gathered his papers and leapt overboard in an attempt to swim to an Allied ship farther out. Historian Cassius Dio claimed that Caesar would have drowned if he hadn't been able to remove his purple garment. Still, he managed to swim the distance and survive. The Alexandrians recovered the cloak and used it as a trophy to commemorate the Roman debacle. Unhappy with Ganymedes and wanting their king restored, the Alexandrians approached Caesar with a compromise. Caesar agreed to release Ptolemy XIII after entreating him to spare the kingdom and remain loyal to Rome. Once freed, however, the king defied the agreement and continued the war. By this time, a faithful ally of Caesar's, Mithridates, arrived in Egypt, clashing with Ptolemy's troops at Pelusium. Outnumbering the enemy, Mithridates secured the region between Pelusium and Alexandria. Ptolemy, warned of Caesar's ally marching on Alexandria, sent his troops to prevent passage over the river. Ogalos, Mithridates warned Caesar in time, and the two groups confronted the armies of Ptolemy in the Delta. In the Battle of the Nile, the Romans gained the upper hand, sending the Egyptians fleeing. In the tumult and panic, King Ptolemy XIII drowned in the Nile. After the siege ended, Cleopatra VII married her younger brother, Ptolemy XIV, enabling her to reign over Egypt until 30 BCE. Under her rule, Alexandria settled into its position within the Roman Empire, 
and eventually surpassed Athens as one of the most important cities in the Roman Empire. Julius Caesar remained in Egypt for a short time. He and Cleopatra would later have a son named Caesarion. Welcome to Alexandria, a commercial hub. The ports of Alexandria were a major commercial hub, effectively connecting Egypt with the Mediterranean regions and beyond. A tremendous amount of materials and goods flowed through the city on a daily basis. The large port market was called the Emporion. It was there that merchandise was traded by the ship owners, called Nakliros. Food and other artisan work streamed out of Egypt. Ceramics, glass, golden rings, and minted coinage. The local potters, using traditional Egyptian techniques, competed with those from abroad, and the textile industry flourished. What Egypt did not produce itself was acquired through trade, using local resources such as wheat and papyrus. Most sought after was pine wood from Syria, iron and marble from the Greek islands, gold from Spain, and exotic fruits from Europe. All this commercial activity contributed to the already decadent wealth of the city. <laughs> The wood imported to Port Mariotis through Alexandria's seaward ports was used in the nearby shipyards, where most of Egypt's ships were built. Employing tens of thousands of shipbuilders, the shipyards contributed to establishing the Egyptian fleet as one of the mightiest of the era. Any wood not used in shipbuilding was further disseminated through Egypt for various purposes. The southern port of Lake Mariotis was the biggest in Alexandria. Save for a branch angling westward, the lake's size in the Ptolemaic era was roughly 40 to 50 kilometers from north to south. Its waters were maintained by a steady runoff from the Nile. In addition to the lake, a man-made canal was created to assist in the transfer of goods from the city to the port using barges, though it is not represented in the game due to its size. Banking was one of the most distinctive innovations brought by the Greeks to Egypt. 
The centerpiece of Alexandria's wealth was the royal systematization of taxes on almost everything. Basic items such as salt, oil, beer, wheat, and linen were heavily taxed. As a result, the royal treasury of Alexandria was able to ensure the economic stability of most of the administrative areas of Egypt. By the late 12th century, the channel feeding the lake from the Nile silted up. Lake Mariotis lost its connection to the Mediterranean, as well as most of its water, as the lake slowly evaporated to a fraction of its former size. In modern times, Lake Mariotis is being kept alive through irrigation. However, only about 17% of its original size remains. to Alexandria, planning of the city. Welcome to Alexandria, City of Celebration. Like most Greek cities, Alexandria offered multiple forms of entertainment. Most were related to cults, religious practices, and the festivities surrounding those practices. Among those festivities, the most important ones were the dynastic celebrations instituted in honor of the deified Ptolemaic kings and queens. These celebrations could go on for many days and included sacrifices, offerings, processions, and public banquets. Games and competitions were organized whenever possible in locations such as the stadium, the hippodrome, and the gymnasium. The residents of Alexandria favored such events where athletes, poets, and musicians from Egypt and other cities of the Greek world competed. Like all good Greek cities, Alexandria had a theater. The architecture of this structure is Roman in style. This is because the team duplicated a theater from Cyrene. Roman theaters were usually semicircular and built from scratch on a flat area with structures designed to enhance oration. Greek theaters were more oblong in shape, similar to a horseshoe, 
and favored the slopes of natural hills to support their acoustics. At the theater, one could witness the plays of contemporary comic and tragic authors. The play you are witnessing below is Menander's Discalos, more commonly known as the Grouch, a late and popular entry in the Greek comedies. Welcome to Education in Alexandria. The education of young Alexandrians did not differ from the one generally dispensed elsewhere in ancient Greece. At the age of seven, the child was taken in charge by a tutor, who then became responsible for instilling an elementary education as well as good moral principles. Teaching was generally done outside, in the open air. In the gymnasium, students were taught not only sports, but also topics such as rhetoric, philosophy, music, and poetry. All things deemed essential to one's education at the time. Here, both girls and boys are shown attending a class given by one of the rhetoricians of the era. The team made the choice to show both genders attending class within the context of the game world. Even though it is historically inaccurate, the team felt it was not necessary to prioritize historical sexism over inclusive gameplay. Welcome to the Great Library of Alexandria. Near the district of royal palaces and within the Moseon was the most famous library of all antiquity. The Library of Alexandria was built to house all of human knowledge. At its pinnacle, the library was believed to contain over 700,000 parchments. Throughout the centuries, fires and wars between Christianity and paganism destroyed the library, leaving nothing behind. The loss of the building, and more importantly, its vast collection is immeasurable. As no descriptions are available, the team's rendition of the Library of Alexandria was inspired by the visuals of the Library of Chalcis at Ephesus. While much of the collection was purchased at the government's expense, the library also obtained books through other means. Any books owned by travelers coming through the city were seized to be copied for the library. The copy would then be returned to the owner and the original entered into the library's collection.
Alexandria offered unrivaled intellectual and cultural attractions. Eminent scholars from Athens, Rhodes, and other Greek centers traveled to the city to learn and engage with other free thinkers. Both the Moseon and the library were at the center of groundbreaking ideas and creative expression. <laughs> The great minds of antiquity were usually well versed in many disciplines, which were often associated to specific schools of thought. The Peripatetics, the Stoics, and the Cynics were among the most well known schools of the time. It is clear that Alexandria lived up to its fundamental role as a city for intellectuals, nurturing many great minds whose impact reverberates through our modern world. Hypatia of Alexandria was a Greek mathematician, philosopher, astronomer, and inventor. Though born in Greece, she eventually migrated to Alexandria, like many great minds of the time. It is there that she became the head of the Neoplatonist school of Alexandria. From most accounts, she was highly respected by her fellow Alexandrians, both as a teacher and a philosopher. With her death, the age of great ancient scientific discoveries came to an end. Helimachus was born in Cyrene and educated in Athens. After his studies, he moved to Alexandria to work in the great library. A poet and a critic, he strongly rejected the epic format of Homeric poems and instead fervently supported a shorter, more judiciously formulated style of poetry. His epigrams and elegiac poems were emulated by later poets. His work was extremely popular, second only to Homer's own works. It was in Alexandria that mathematician Euclid, the father of geometry, wrote the elements, laying out the foundational work of what would become modern algebra and number theory. Euclidean geometry would become one of the most influential systems in the evolution of mathematics. <laughs> How do you calculate the circumference of the Earth? With a camel, two sticks, and shadows cast by the sun. This is what Eratosthenes of Cyrene described in his principal work, Geography, while he was director of the Great Library of Alexandria. He is credited for the invention of the armillary spear around 250 BCE. The earliest known and most complete armillary sphere of antiquity was the Meteoroscopion of Alexandria, with an imposing nine rings compared to the three or four of most other astrolabes. Known as the Zodiac Krikatoi amongst the Greeks, the Meteoroscopion was used to determine the location of celestial bodies around the Earth. Every self-respecting astronomer of antiquity would have sought to use this tool to better understand the celestial movements. Mm. Pythagoras of Samos was a well-known and respected philosopher and mathematician. He is best known for the Pythagorean theorem. However, there is proof that the theorem existed in Babylonia and India long before Pythagoras was born, casting some doubts as to who exactly originated the theorem. Let me see. 
Welcome to the Moseon of Alexandria. The Moseon was a sector of the city commissioned by Ptolemy I to rival Athens Academy as an institute of intellectual pursuit. Dedicated to the nine inspiring muses, the Moseon became a great center for philosophical and scientific enlightenment. It welcomed scholars from many kingdoms, inviting them to share knowledge in literature, science, and geography. The Moseon was designed so that its buildings and grounds would accommodate free thinking, debate, and presentation. Meeting spaces and theaters surrounded a main courtyard. Expansive gardens were filled with exotic plants that aided in the study and supply of herbs and medicines. A zoo offered the study of animal behavior and physiology. Also among the Moseon's many star attractions was its astronomical observatory. Herophilus was a physician who lived most of his life in Alexandria. He was able to perform the dissection of human cadavers on a large scale due to the permissiveness of the city in such matters. Among many other discoveries, he learned that the brain was central to the human nervous system. He also extensively mapped the blood system and measured the pulse with the aid of a water clock. It is reported that in his thirst to understand human anatomy, he performed 600 vivisections on live prisoners. In order to be free to pursue their research, scholars were fed and housed at the Moseon at the government's expense. This freedom provided Alexandria scholars a meeting space for intellectual pursuits and a haven for spiritual peace. Though nothing remains of the original Moseon, it lives on as the legacy of our modern museums. Welcome to the Serapion of Alexandria. In a city of numerous magnificent attractions, the Serapion was considered to be the most beautiful temple of Alexandria. Located southwest of the city on a small hill known as the Acropolis, the sanctuary was constructed during the reign of Ptolemy III upon foundations which had existed since the reign of Ptolemy I Soter. Visitors of the Serapion climbed a hundred steps to reach the courtyard. Libraries were installed in the porticos surrounding the square building, with its roof and columns adorned with gold and gilded bronze. Pharaohs were generous to the temple, as were several Roman emperors after Egypt's conquest. 
An inner temple housed the statue of Serapis, dedicated to healing the sick. Since the 26th dynasty, Greeks in Egypt had gradually integrated the Egyptian cult of the Apis bull to their own rituals. With the establishment of the Ptolemaic dynasty, the cult of Apis was further integrated into Greek religion. During his rule, Ptolemy I chose to merge Egyptian and Hellenic gods into a syncretic divinity named Serapis. This name was the result of the amalgamation of Osiris and Apis. With this new deity, the Ptolemaic dynasty managed to accommodate similar belief sets for two different cultures, bringing about a new dynastic cult. Serapis was also associated to other deities, including Asclepius, a Greek god of healing. It is possible that, as with the Serapis temple of Canopus, the sick would visit this sanctuary, sleeping there overnight in the hopes of being healed within its hallowed halls. Welcome to the Islands of Ferris. The Heptastadion was a bridge-like causeway connecting the island of Ferris to mainland Alexandria. Its name is based on the Greek terms of measurement, hepta meaning seven, and stadion, which is a measure of length of roughly 180 meters. Since its construction would separate the Grand Port to the east and the Port of Eunostos to the west, it was designed with channels at each end. These openings allowed passage from one port to the other. Along with creating separate harbors for the commercial and military shipping, the causeway served as a main aqueduct for the island's inhabitants. Its presence also helped protect the island and its ports from rough wind and sea currents. At the end of antiquity, the Heptastadion disappeared under layers of silt and soil, which formed an important sedimentary deposit. While the Serapion was the most celebrated of the temples in Alexandria, many other temples were built within the city. 
Most of these structures have been completely erased over time, and there is no way to discern how many existed. However, research of ancient papyri offer tantalizing hints as to the possible location of at least some of the temples. Both papyri and coins reveal evidence of many temples built for the gods. Poseidon, the god of the sea, likely had an edifice in his honor west of this island, as well as on the mainland. This temple next to you is dedicated to Iset Feria, the divine protector of the lighthouse. This location hosted annual celebrations in the month of April, known as the Sacrum Feria, in connection to the lighthouse. In her incarnation as Iset Fortuna, the goddess carries a rudder and a cornucopia, both symbols of good luck for navigators. Considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Lighthouse of Alexandria was a source of great pride for the inhabitants of the city. Construction began under Ptolemy I's reign and lasted 15 years. It was completed during his son's rule. Once completed, the lighthouse was dedicated to the gods for the salvation of those who sail the sea. Built on the island of Ferris, the stone structure was three tiers set on top of one another in a step formation. The second floor consisted of an octagonal tower and the top floor was a cylindrical tower topped by a statue. The interior provided space for staff rooms and a ramp which allowed the transport of fuel to the upper floors. Essential to safe navigation through the rifts and shallow waters, the Ferris was a functioning lighthouse with a beam reportedly visible 50 kilometers away. It's unclear what kind of fuel was used or how much. Any other details of how the light worked remain a mystery. For several centuries, the Ferris was one of the highest monuments ever built by man. It measured roughly 110 meters in height, compared to the Pyramid of Giza, which was around 140 meters tall. Gradually, the structure was eroded by earthquakes and then completely destroyed in 1480 CE, when a fort was built over it. Archaeological excavations on the seabed have uncovered many blocks from the ancient building. to the Panaean. The Panaean was a temple built in honor of the god Pan, divinity of nature. This Greek god, often represented as a half-man, half-goat, with a beard, horns, and goat's hooves, was considered the protector of shepherds and herds. Pan's attribute was his namesake musical instrument, the Pan flute. His temples were usually located in caves 
and on high mountains, and were frequented by shepherds. It is likely that Mediterranean cults adopted the imagery of Pan to symbolize the Christian devil. To give proper honor to the god, Alexandrians built an artificial hill upon which they housed his temple to compensate for the flat relief of the city. The artificial mound had the shape of a spinning top or a pine cone, which was accessed by a spiral staircase. The top had a panoramic view of the entire city. Only such heights would be fitting for a mountain god. Welcome to the Hippodrome of Alexandria. The main Hippodrome of the city was called the Legeon, in honor of Lagos, the ancestor of the Ptolemies. Alexandrians were great lovers of horse racing. They were fascinated by the rivalry of these races. The Agon, as it was said at that time, that every competition brought. It was a struggle for glory. The most important chariot race was the Tethrapon. Using four horses with the quickest harness to the front right, the charioteer would race for 12 laps with sharp turns at either end of the hippodrome. The victors were crowned with garlands of olive and received prize money, but the most sought after reward was to be acclaimed by the works of poets, such as Callimachus and Pindar. Ye hymns that rule the lyre, what god, what hero, I, and what man shall we loudly praise? Verily Zeus is the lord of Pisa, and Heracles established the Olympic festival, while Theron must be proclaimed by reason of his victorious chariot with its four horses, Theron, who is just in his regard for guests, and who is the bulwark of Acragas, the choicest flower of an auspicious line of sires, whose city towers on high, bringing wealth and glory to crown their native merits. Welcome to Cleopatra, Queen of Egypt. Cleopatra VII Theophilipater ascended the throne in 51 BCE at the age of 18. Though her early attempts to maintain power were often challenged, she eventually prevailed and became the sole ruler of Egypt. According to Plutarch, she was the only Ptolemaic pharaoh to speak the Egyptian language. Her intelligence, coupled with a good education and a great political mind, allowed her to make the alliances necessary to maintain the independence of Egypt while Rome was becoming a Mediterranean empire. Mm -hmm. 
It is important to understand that Cleopatra's knowledge of Egyptian language and keen understanding of the culture allowed her to make powerful ideological reference that resonated with ancient Egyptians. By associating herself with the goddess Isid, the Divine Mother, Great of Magic, and Repository of Divine Essence, Cleopatra firmly established herself as the protector of the two lands and legitimized her place on the throne. Upon his death in 51 BCE, Ptolemy XII Aulus bequeathed his kingdom to his daughter and eldest son, Cleopatra VII and Ptolemy XIII. As was custom, the siblings were married. The new pharaoh was 10 years old, his sister wife 17. The early years of their reign were not easy. Between 50 and 48 BCE, droughts and floods aggravated Egypt's problems. General Achilles and the royal advisor Pothinos kept intervening in the young ruler's political decisions and eventually colluded to turn Ptolemy XIII against Cleopatra. By 48 BCE, Cleopatra was in exile. During Cleopatra's exile, the Roman Empire was not without its own internal conflict. Caesar and Pompey were at war with one another, and after his defeat in 48 BCE, Pompey fled to Alexandria in the hope of finding refuge. This turned out to be an unwise decision. Listening to his advisors, Ptolemy XIII elected to have Pompey assassinated, his head kept as a gift in the hopes of acquiring Caesar's favor. This gambit backfired. Instead of earning approval, the murder of a Roman greatly angered Caesar. Cleopatra, aware of Caesar's anger against Ptolemy for the murder of Pompey, decided to take advantage of the situation. She returned to Egypt in secret, hoping to establish an alliance with one of the most powerful men of the time. Outside of the legend, where she had herself smuggled into his quarters in a carpet, what exactly happened during that fateful meeting remains a mystery. However, Caesar seemed to see a better ruler for Egypt in Cleopatra, than in her young and too easily influenced brother. Invoking Ptolemy XII's will, Caesar attempted to mediate peace between the siblings. Ptolemy XIII was enraged by the turn of events, and his advisors were none too happy to see Cleopatra return. Urged on by General Achilles and Pothinos, the young pharaoh plotted against Caesar and Cleopatra, resulting in the siege of Alexandria in 47 BCE. It was in March 47 BCE that Caesar defeated Ptolemy XIII's forces. The young pharaoh drowned in the Nile after having fled the battlefield. With her opponents dead or powerless, Cleopatra married her other much younger brother, Ptolemy XIV, and finally claimed the throne of Egypt for good. The end of the Alexandrian War also cemented the romantic and political alliance between Cleopatra and Caesar. In June of 47 BCE, Cleopatra gave birth to a son, whom she called Caesarian. Caesar did not accept the boy as his heir, choosing instead his nephew Octavian. Nonetheless, on his return to Rome, Caesar invited the queen and her brother husband to stay in the city. Her presence still drew much disapproval from the Senate. Always a strategist, Caesar left four legions in Egypt, and a man he trusted to direct Egyptian affairs, 
giving him control of the wheat supplies essential to Rome. Cleopatra and her entourage remained in Rome until March 44 BCE, when Caesar was murdered. Caesar's most faithful ally, Mark Antony, often visited the Queen of Egypt during his stay in Rome. Unlike most, he recognized the legitimacy of Caesarion, the natural son of Caesar. Antony knew he would need the riches of Egypt in order to fight Octavian and claim the Roman Empire. Cleopatra, in return, saw a powerful ally. In the winter of 41 BCE, she arranged a sumptuous tour of Egypt by boat to show Antony the wealth of her country and the power she held as its ruler. A romantic and political relationship followed. The Roman Senate was once again most displeased. To calm spirits in Rome, Antony married Octavia, sister of Octavian. Despite his marriage to Octavia, Antony remained Cleopatra's lover, and she gave birth to their children. Cleopatra increased her kingdom's territory and started a political propaganda alongside her lover in Egypt and beyond. She hoped to create a Ptolemaic federal empire with Alexandria at its center. Antony eventually repudiated his Roman wife for the Egyptian queen, much to the dismay of the Roman elite. However, while Mark Antony focused on Egypt, Octavian carefully gained military and political ascendancy over him in Rome. Octavian managed his own propaganda campaign and succeeded. The Roman people hated Mark Antony and Cleopatra. To avoid the censure still inherent in attacking a fellow Roman, Octavian simply declared war against Egypt. Rome's power still reigned supreme. The powerful Egyptian fleet, led by Cleopatra as well as Mark Antony's forces, were defeated in 31 BCE in Actium. Octavian arrived in Egypt in 30 BCE to formalize his victory. The following events remain difficult to confirm due to the many versions and legends around them. It is believed that after hearing a rumor about Cleopatra's suicide, Mark Antony committed suicide himself. He was brought to the queen as he slowly passed away. Knowing that Octavian would have her chained and paraded through Rome in defeat, Cleopatra planned her own suicide. She most likely killed herself with arsenic, Though admittedly, the version where she uses an asp to deliver a fatal bite may be considered more dramatic. What happened to the body of Cleopatra is still a mystery. Welcome to the Greek Pharaohs.
pharaohs were considered divine incarnations of the gods. As an avatar of the gods living on earth, the pharaoh's role was to preserve fundamental values and universal harmony by removing chaos, isfet, and ensure that justice, mot, prevailed. The pharaoh, by divine ancestry and through multiple offerings, was the bond that unites the world of men to the world of the gods and allows the maintenance of the cosmic order. The Ptolemaic dynasty reigned over Egypt from 305 BCE to 30 BCE. The dynasty was called the Ptolemies of the Lagids in recognition of the founder of the dynasty, Ptolemy Lagos, a Greek general and close friend of Alexander the Great. While Macedonian, Ptolemy Lagos understood that to be accepted by the Egyptian people, he would have to adopt their traditions. Upon assuming the title of Pharaoh, he changed his name to Ptolemy I Soter, meaning savior. Born in 356 BCE, Alexander the Great went through a hasty education in the affairs of the kingdom before integrating into the Macedonian army, where he quickly rose through the ranks. After his father's assassination in 336 BCE, which some believed was orchestrated by Alexander himself, he became king of Macedonia. Ruler of a unified kingdom and leader of a large army, Alexander set his sights on conquest. Eager to reclaim the Greek cities of Asia Minor, he took on the Persian forces, earning victory after victory. Ever victorious, Alexander the Great marched on, laying siege to city after city until he reached Egypt, where the Persians were defeated yet again. Viewed as a liberator by the Egyptian people, Alexander decided to become Pharaoh in due form. He traveled to Thebes to make a sacrifice to Apis, then went to the oasis of Siwa, where he was proclaimed son of Amun. Officially Pharaoh of Egypt, Alexander spent much of the winter there and founded the city of Alexandria. Perhaps not coincidentally, being pharaoh allowed Alexander to spread propaganda to prepare further conquests. He resumed his military campaigns in 331 BCE. On his deathbed in 323 BCE, Alexander the Great gifted the satrapy of Egypt to Ptolemy Lagos. Perfectly aware of the value of Egypt, Ptolemy ensured not only the stability of the country's borders, but also its economic and military development. At the same time, he worked with the Egyptian elite to maintain the internal order of the country. By 305 BCE, Ptolemy, well respected both in Egypt and in the Mediterranean, was at the head of the largest fleet of the Hellenistic world. Ptolemy officially took the title of Pharaoh of Egypt in January 304 BCE, on the anniversary of Alexander the Great's death. Alexander died in Babylon in 323 BCE. His remains were placed first in a solid gold sarcophagus and then within another. The casket was carried in an ornate custom wagon, gilded and set with precious stones, and pulled by 64 mules crowned with gold. The funeral procession was diverted to a grandiose temple in Alexandria, built in the conqueror's honor under the orders of Ptolemy I. Julius Caesar visited Alexander's tomb at the capture of Alexandria, and the Roman Emperor Augustus reportedly placed flowers there. However, though many powerful leaders claim to have visited it, 
the tomb's location has gone missing from history. Some accounts do state that the golden coffin was replaced by a glass sarcophagus, probably by Ptolemy X. It is also implied that Cleopatra may have plundered the tomb in a time of financial crisis. Welcome to Roman Military Equipment. The strength of Rome was directly dependent on its military supremacy and fundamentally militaristic society. Regular citizens, comprised mostly of farmers and herders, joined to protect their land and families. In return for their service, members of this civic army were allowed to vote Trained to be highly disciplined and obedient to superior officers, citizen soldiers developed a deep sense of loyalty to their city. The quality of the armor of a Roman foot soldier was intrinsically linked to his social status and wealth. Chain mail was the most commonly used type of armor. Scale armor, made famous in today's media, came into use after Caesar's time. Foot soldiers carried large and oblong shields, while the cavalry used smaller ones of Greek origin. Soldiers were expected to carry their own kit, including the tools required for the construction of forts and tents. Roman soldiers used the same types of weapons. The stomach and face were the most targeted parts of the body. As such, a legionary was equipped with two close combat weapons, a dagger and a short sword, known as a gladius. One of the most ingenious Roman weapons was the javelin. Its pyramid-shaped tip pierced the body, while its iron shank was designed to break upon impact, stopping the enemy from throwing it back. During their conquests, the Romans regularly transformed enemy technologies to add to their own formidable arsenal. After capturing a Carthaginian vessel, the Romans adopted its better features and constructed a superior fleet of ships. Adapting heavy artillery designs from Greek models aided the Romans in building catapults and ballistae. The latter became an iconic symbol of Roman warfare. Welcome to Roman Forts. The size of a Roman military camp, known as a castrum, varied significantly depending on how many soldiers it needed to accommodate. However, they all shared common characteristics in design and construction, such as this fort before you, located in Cape Chersonesos.
Rectangular in shape, the forts were heavily fortified by ramparts and a ditch system. The walls were reinforced with parapets, essentially an extension at the roof line which allowed a protective barrier for patrolling soldiers. Depending on the availability of materials, some forts were built with stone, timbers, stacked turf, and particularly in the eastern part of the empire, baked brick. Access doors on all four sides were each flanked by guard towers. The commanding officer was positioned in the middle of the camp, giving him a clear view of the troops and the main gate. Along with sleeping barracks for the soldiers, the fort also had a granary that was expected to hold rations for a year or longer. To ensure the health of the soldiers, every camp was equipped with medical staff and a hospital. A clean water supply with conduits for a bathhouse and latrines was included in the construction of every fort. Welcome to the Forts of Cyrenaica. <laughs> Cyrenaica was a Libyan region under Roman control, gifted to Rome by one of Cleopatra's ancestors. The remains and foundations of ancient fortifications were discovered in the 19th century in the southwest of Cyrenaica as well as a Roman garrison dating back to the first century CE. Evidence shows that these forts were of Libyan origin, rebuilt and modified by Roman engineers when Cyrenaica was part of the empire. Stone was the most commonly used material to build forts in Egypt and Cyrenaica. Though no real proof of a fortress similar to the one before you has been uncovered in that region, the team chose to add it as a worthy and awe-inspiring end-of-game challenge for the player. The forts of Cyrenaica were intended to prevent invaders from gaining access to the main route that led to the country's five most important cities. These forts were built close to coastal plains and deserts for added defense. Three of these cities were recreated by the team, Balagre, Apollonia, and Cyrene. Had it existed, the fort before you would have protected the road leading to Balagre. Other than reference to an attack around 404 CE and a military reorganization by Emperor Justinian during the 6th century CE, we still know little of the Roman military presence in Cyrenaica.
Welcome to Roman Aqueducts. Water management was taken seriously by the Romans. Cyrenaica benefited greatly from Roman administration with the construction of aqueducts and canals. The source of water varied depending on the location. Many aqueducts were built at the foot of the mountains, offering greater flow from the melting snow. The ability to transport water over a greater distance increased agricultural production. Some aqueducts were reported to be over seven kilometers in length. Where the Greeks of Libya originally focused mainly on olive trees and figs, which required less water, the advent of Roman aqueducts allowed for a far greater crop diversity. Every farm's water use was carefully scheduled. The engineering methods used to create aqueducts were constantly reviewed, with a clear focus on exploiting the local environment. Materials, water usage, cleaning regulations, and a deep understanding of how to exploit gravity itself were all important concerns. Gravity is Several fortresses were built to protect the aqueducts, basins, and cisterns. Additional water was collected with wells and cisterns, but aqueducts were the main supply of fresh water. The water was distributed based on the collective needs of the city before the private needs of an individual. Almost all aqueducts ended in a fountain where the water circulated to clean the streets and supply bathhouses and latrines, thus improving the cleanliness of Cyrenaica's cities. Welcome to Crucifixion. In terms of the severity of Roman justice, crucifixion was at the top of the list of corporal punishment, followed by death by fire and decapitation. The upper class considered crucifixion unworthy of their position. Those lucky enough to have Roman citizenship were also exempt from such treatment. Easily accessible, crucifixions were popular entertainment among the citizenry. Unlike throwing victims to wild animals, which required an arena, crucifixions did not require any particular setting.
Those subjected to crucifixion were almost always slaves, traitors, and lower class citizens. Roman deserters were crucified because the betrayal of the soldiers was perceived as endangering the lives of Roman citizens. In 71 BCE, a major slave uprising in Italia was repressed by the Roman army. This resulted in the crucifixion of 6,000 men, including their leader, a slave and former gladiator known as Spartacus. Still got loads to go. That's the end of my stream for the time being. the end of my stream. I'm not going to get straight to eat. the end of my stream until another griffing episode of Assassin's Creed Tour which will probably be tomorrow now <laughs>